Good day, everybody. Randy Franklin Smith here. And today, we've got something really cool. Instead of anatomy of a specific hack, we're going to talk about uh, the greater, larger picture of a particular hacker group. That is APT29, also known as Cozy Bear. And um, this is going to be super interesting. And I've got some special guests with me here today from Logarithm. I want to introduce you to Sally Vincent and Brian Colson, um, who um, work on the threat research team and have been doing some uh, research on this group. And uh, uh, to Sally, uh, you want to go first? Just tell us a little bit about your background and your street cred and um, um, what you've been doing with regard to APT29. Sure. Thanks, Randy. So I actually started off my career as an electrical engineer before I got into network security. So I've been an admin for quite a while uh, for multiple different systems, Windows and Linux environments. I've been a SOC member, um, security analyst, a principal engineer at Logarithm, a security consultant at Logarithm, and now I'm part of the threat research team where part of our job is taking apart malware and making uh, content that our, that our users can use in their own environment. So we've been having a lot of fun these past couple of weeks running APT29 in our malware labs and grabbing out some indicators to show to you guys today. Awesome. Brian? Hi, and I'm Brian Colson. I've been with Logarithm for about three and a half years. I uh, joined the threat research team from uh, another company where I performed uh, a lot of uh, security operations type of work uh, at a clear defense contractor type of corporation, so definitely familiar with a lot of fun uh, or interesting intrusion sets. Um, and uh, at Logarithm, I'm primarily focused in on, of course, on the modules that we create. Uh, We've been really heavily focused in on the MITRE ATT&CK module lately, and we'll definitely talk more about the MITRE ATT&CK techniques here in a little bit. So um, let's just talk and ask you folks a couple quick questions about what you know so far about Cozy Bear. And uh, here's a quick poll. Just We just would like to get some quick feedback from you on how familiar you are with APT29. And then we got one more question after this, and this kind of helps tailor our presentation, Sally and, and Brian. It's it's nice to know where people stand, right? Definitely. Okay, we got. I'm going to close it once we get to 50%, and we are there. And just so you know how you and your uh, uh, colleagues are with this, um, it makes sense. Somewhat familiar is uh, the lion's share. No, no mm -hmm. big surprise there. And um, here's the other poll. So here's some of the stuff that they do. And we're just wondering, are any of these of particular concern to your organization? You can check all that apply. So whether it's spear phishing, bypassing, UAC, being able to get copies of files. And we're at 39%. We're coming up on 50%. And I'm going to go ahead and close it and share the results. Um, so looks like the biggest interest is in uh, spear phishing. Uh, the early on, you know, the early steps in an attack life cycle. So that's cool. Thanks a lot. Um, and how does that line up with what you were expecting, Brian, Sally? Yeah, I think spot on, actually. So definitely we'll jump right into it and be able to talk a lot about it. Okay, so here's the thing. When we start looking at um, a group and one that is uh, like Cozy Bear, they, they look like they are state-sponsored, and um, it's interesting their profile has kind of gone up and down in terms of their activity profile 
over the years, and attribution is always uh, a difficult thing, but you know, you can only hide so much of what you're doing, you can only obfuscate so much, and um, it, it, you know, becomes evident that um, there is a specific group who's reusing specific tactics and so on, and that's largely how we're able to um, identify these different groups. But Cozy Bear in particular is interesting, and uh, Sally, why don't you get us started with uh, your research? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cozy Bear is really interesting. They have a long history since at least 2008, and they're really becoming more relevant again now that we're coming up on a presidential election. So, Brian, do you want to jump? Uh, Brian is starting us off here. So do you want to jump into Brian's slides and get going? All right. All right, there we go. All right, so we went over a little bit about me. Here's my wonderful picture. It needs to be updated. Um, it's definitely an older picture, but anyway, that's about me, and I won't go more into it. And Sally? Yep, that is me, and that is also an older picture. <laughs> <laughs> several years ago, <laughs> more than several. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, just I'm real quick on the agenda. The picture is on the website. Sorry. Keep going, Brian. <laughs> That's all right, Randy. <laughs> all right. So our agenda today, we're going to cover more about the APT29 background. We're going to cover the MITRE techniques used, also anatomy of an attack um, by Microsoft that uh, uh, they observed, and also we'll go more into several of the techniques, and also we will cover a couple of threat hunts uh, in video form. All right. So what is MITRE attack? Well, from MITRE uh, themselves, it's a, the definition is a curated knowledge base of and model for cyber adversary behavior. Now, we've done a lot of great presentations, a lot of them also with uh, Randy talking about um, uh, MITRE attack techniques and whatnot. Uh, so definitely welcome you to check out those other webinars uh, to really get in depth about MITRE attack uh, itself. So we won't get that more into MITRE attack framework itself uh, during this webinar, but just want to point out that we have a lot of great resources and content out there already. All right, so talking a little bit about MITRE attack groups. So Groups, I'm just going to read this uh, first paragraph aloud here real quick. And groups are sets of related intrusion activity that are tracked by a common name in the security community. Basically, what that means is that there are, you know, it's a known adversarial presence. It's a person, it's several people that come together and they have a mission and objective. And whatever that objective is, it can be in a case of like APT or advanced persistent threat, nation state sponsored, which means that a nation wants to know this information about whatever it is that they want to gather from a corporation, from another government entity, so forth and so on. So there are designated these specific names uh, like APT29 based upon current techniques that they use as well as procedures. Um, so that's really what the groupings are and that's what APT29 is, is they're part of this group. Awesome. So really quick, I just want to talk about what is an advanced persistent threat a little bit more. So an APT is defined as an organized, long-term, stealthy operation, usually having the goal to steal data. They're, like Brian said, they're typically a nation state or a state sponsored group. They also have some really fun names. Uh, a couple of notable ones from Russia again. We have APT28, which is Fancy Bear. They're notable for using zero-day zero exploits, again, spear phishing, and malware to compromise targets like NATO and a recent French, French presidential campaign. From Iran, we have APT35, aka Charming Kitten which sounds adorable. They are best known for impersonating company websites and using fake DNS domains to fish people's passwords. In 2017, they attacked HBO and ended up leaking Game of Thrones episodes that had not been aired yet. So also from Russia, we have APT29, and we're talking about them today. So APT29 has several names. They're also called Cozy Bear. And it's a group from Russia thought to be sponsored by 
either the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service or the Russian Federal Security Service. There were Russian comments found in their malware, and timestamps point to Russian time zones. I remember Moscow was one um, in specific. Cozy Bear is thought to have been active since 2008, with targets indicating clear Russian interests. Spear phishing um, is, tends to be their main infection vector. And in 2014, agents of the Dutch General Intelligence and Security Service infiltrated Cozy Bear, and they found out that Cozy Bear was targeting the U.S. Democratic Party, the State Department, and the White House. For a little bit more background um, in depth on APT29, I definitely recommend reading F. Secure's white paper called The Dukes, Seven Years of Russian Cyber Espionage. It's a little bit of a long read, but it's very interesting. F. Secure calls APT29 The Dukes because of their malware tool sets, which include Cozy Duke, Cloud Duke, and Hammer Duke. All right, Brian. All right, this is a um, quick screenshot of the MITRE Tech Group AP29 from uh, MITRE Tech's uh, enterprise uh, uh, grid here, where it highlights the different techniques as to what uh, makes up AP29 techniques. You can also select different APT groups and whatnot to be able to see visually uh, the techniques being used across the board. It's really nice. It's a good visual. The link's down there on the slide. Um, and of course, also Logarithm, we've also created um, an overlay for this as well too, a JSON file that you can add to it uh, to show all the different techniques in which Logarithm also covers as well too. Uh, but this again is a nice visual way to be able to see the different techniques. And also from there, you can drill into each technique and uh, get more information about that technique. So low commentary on tactics, technique, and procedures, also known as TTPs. Well, once they become known, so once they're published like on MITRE ATT&CK's website, then anyone can emulate that adversary. So for example, APT29 has been widely studied uh, by a number of different great security companies, lots of great white papers written about them. Also MITRE has a lot of great information about the group in detail as well as reference links. Now, once you have all that information together, now that can easily be pivoted and trained upon by other kinds of uh, adversary emulation type of tools. One of those tools we're going to talk about here in a little bit is on how we be able to use this tool to be able to emulate the adversary in a safe way to be able to find ways that we can detect the adversary presence, mainly the techniques uh, being used on our network. And yeah, of course, but... we're going to be... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sally. Oh, I was just going to add in that APT29 is super well known for changing up their TTPs very fast. So very quickly, you know, days or even hours after um, items are published about them, they're going to change up uh, their tool sets, which really is a strong indicator that they've got a lot of money, it's a large uh, team they have, and it's state-sponsored. Right, and as soon as an adversary changes up their techniques, I mean, it's or especially the procedures, it's really difficult to be able to then uh, maintain a presence, you know, like or be able to understand that this presence is still on your network too. So definitely, not tipping off the adversary is a um, a good method to go by. But of course, also uh, burning their tools as fast as possible is something that a lot of companies do because they can't accept the risk of having um, an adversary on the network and be able to observe them for a period of time. But the key area that we're going to focus in a uh, uh, you know, as far as like a quick win is the initial access area. And that's for out, right around the spear phishing aspects of it, right? Spear phishing uh, um, with attachments or spear phishing links according to MITRE ATT&CK. There's a lot of great information about that. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. And then of course, it's also um, as an adversary gets a foothold on the network, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to be able to detect that adversary in the network, whether it's due to a lack of endpoint visibility, you no know, logging on the endpoints, or also the adversary now using tools that are where they're living off the land, using stuff that's already on a system so they don't have to bring another tool set with them.
We're going to cover a little bit here about anatomy of an attack. This is Microsoft's observation of YTTRIUM, which is also another name for APT29, as we talked about earlier. This is their kind of flow as to how this adversary started their campaign and moved uh, across the um, uh, moved as far as delivering the malware, as well as being able to move laterally. So the unidentified actor starts off by social engineering their target so they can start developing their spear phishing, targeting uh, the people that they want to be able to attack. They construct the spear phish, and in this case, it was an email with a link. So it, with links in particular, it's easy to bypass a lot of antivirus type of uh, solutions, especially anything that is checking for email, because there's nothing for it to scan per se as far as like, uh, an attachment that could be weaponized or whatnot. A link is a link. So unless if that sandboxing tool is going to be able to download that link and then check out what the payload is when you click on download, at the email portion of it, it's likely going to get through and get to the end user. When the end user gets it and they click the link, of course, they're going to initiate a download. Now that's outside of the email aspect of it. Uh, and now they're going to their web browser or whatnot, being able to download whatever it is that they're clicked on, typically some kind of weaponized PDF or something like that. Uh, in this case, it was a zip file uh, that then uh, uh, had a link file and then also a decoy PDF file. Um, so it made it real easy to be able to say, oh yeah, my click didn't really do anything, but it did. Um, because the decoy PDF looks like a real object, of course it's not weaponized, but of course then all of the actions uh, take place via the PowerShell commands, and we'll talk more about on how all that technique um, uh, worked, and being able to detect type of that uh, type of that technique like PowerShell being active in your environment here in a little bit. All right, so the, the techniques in particular that we're going to be covering today. Uh, the, the tactic is initial access, so we'll be talking a little bit about the spear phishing attachment and the spear phishing link. We'll also be talking about the tactic of defense evasion, bypass user account control and indicator removal on host as the techniques, privilege escalation, the technique of bypass user account control, and command and control and lateral movement, remote file copies in both of those tactics, uh, but the technique for remote uh, file copy, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. All right, so spear phishing attachment. We talked about spear phishing attachment on a previous webinar that we gave links to earlier in the discussion here. Also, I just want to point out that uh, if you haven't seen MITRE ATT&CK's uh, website, their enterprise framework here, when you go into a specific technique, you'll see a description of the technique. That's what the screenshot is from. Uh, it gives you a quick synopsis as to what spear phishing attachments are. It gives you, of course, the tactic information, the platforms in which it's obser observed upon data sources in which you can see this type of information or be able to detect spear phishing attachments. Um, and also, of course, when it was created and last modified. Pretty much everyone on the call should know what a spear phishing attachment is, so I'm not going to read anything from the slide here. Uh, but definitely, that is uh, the initial access. That's how most people are compromised, uh, even still today. Now, when we look at the procedure section of the uh, technique, all the techniques will have a procedure section. It'll show which adversarial groups have been known to use this particular technique. And on this list, of course, we see the APT28 that we mentioned earlier, as well as APT29. And APT29 has used spear phishing emails with attachment to deliver file with exploits to initial victims. And of course, it then it gives references so you can read more about it. Spear phishing link, again, just like spear phishing attachment, this is from MITRE ATT&CK's enterprise um, uh, screenshot here. I'm not going to read from it. We pretty much already discussed what a spray phishing link is. It's just a link in an email message. It's more evasive as far as like being able to make it to the end user and not being detected by antivirus or any kind of um, email inspection. Um, and of course, the platforms in which a uh, spear phishing link can be used on, anything from Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Office 365, so forth. Uh, and then how do you detect this type? type of thing. Um, well, we did an earlier webinar on spear phishing link and spear phishing attachment talking specifically around um, Office 365 and how Office 365 actually uh, makes it pretty easy to detect a spear phishing link um, activity uh, and it makes it really easy to be able to pivot off that information and be able to see if anyone actually clicked on it. I believe that Again, content kind of like that we had for 
Oops, sorry, Brian. I was just going to say, like, I think our content for um, detecting spear phishing link got released either this week or it's it's going to be pretty soon, right? Correct. Yeah, actually, at Logarithm, uh, we develop a lot of techniques as far as, or we develop a lot of content around detection of the techniques for MITRE attack. Um, and, uh, yeah, we definitely released that one for our Office 365 this uh, past um, uh, Monday. So definitely it's new content that Logarithm just released. Thanks for that, Sally. Um, all right, so spear phishing link, we look at the procedure examples here again. We see APT29 is on that list and has used spear phishing with a link to trick victims and onto clicking on a link to a zip file containing malicious files. All right, awesome. So now we, I'm going to get into one of mine that I looked at a little bit more in depth, um, which is bypassing user account control. So. Again, this is from the MITRE Enterprise Techniques. I'm definitely not going to read this whole slide here, but um, User Account Control, or UAC, is going to allow a program to elevate its privileges to perform a task as admin. And this is something done for security, but it's also something that can be taken advantage of. So here are some notable uses of this particular technique. Uh, we have APT29 there. And um, I, I will say, though, this is definitely not an exhaustive list um, that MITRE has. There are many more threat actors that have used this. So before I talk a little bit more specifically about exactly how APT29 used this technique, I want to just talk about the registry keys because it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, HKLM software classes key contains the default settings that can apply to all users on a local computer. And HKCU software classes contains the settings that apply only to the interactive user. And then the HKCR key provides a view of the registry that merges the information from those two. And because those two hives are merged, you can hijack keys in HKCR by creating them in HKCU software classes. As a normal user, you can have write access to the keys in HKCU. And if an elevated process interacts with the keys that you are able to manipulate, you can potentially interfere with actions that a high integrity process is attempting to perform. Trusted binaries like FOD Helper, Event Viewer, and Run DLL32 won't show a UAC window when launched or when another process spawns from that trusted binary parent process. The good thing, though, is that this um, technique can be remediated by setting UAC to always notify or by removing the current user from the local admin group. So here are some specific examples of how APT29 uses this technique. And I have an example here on the top from running it from the command line, and I have a an example on the bottom running using PowerShell. I have a couple of sources there in my top right. Um, we're using APT, Invoke APT29 from Greg Foss um, that we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, I also have Atomic Red Team up there. They've got a lot of good information and a lot um, of this is just publicly available on their GitHubs. The next tactic I'm going to talk about is indicator of removal on a host. Indicator of removal is essentially about clearing your ta um, tracks to compromise security solutions and or hamper incident response. Again, here are some notable usages of this tactic. Um, this is definitely something that I've seen all the time in the field, um, done by malware, or done by pen testers. And definitely, if it's something done by pen testers and you catch it, that's a nice feather in your cap for you. So here are some specific examples, again, of how APT29 uses this tactic. We have usage of S-Delete, which is a sysinternals tool that overwrites files and makes them effectively unrecoverable. Um, 
An interesting fact is that when you install and accept um, the end user license agreement for Estelite, it shows up in the registry, which you can see here. This is not usually recorded by Sysmon policy, but you can go and manually check this out if you want to see if somebody has installed Estelite or if it's been installed maliciously on a host. Next, we have the classic clear event log. Um, you can run this multiple ways. And then we have the wiping of the USN change journal. So the update sequence number journal or change journal is a feature of the Windows NT file system, which maintains a record of changes made to the volume. All right, back to you, Brian. Oh, thanks for that, Sally. Excellent. All right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the technique of remote file copy, uh, the tactic under uh, for command and control and lateral movement. So remote file copy, pretty much as it sounds, we can kind of conjure exactly what that really means here. But it's basically files may be copied from one system to another to stage adversarial tools or other files over the course of an operation. Uh, files may be copied from an external adversary control system through the command and control channel to bring tools into the victim network or through alternate protocols with another tool such as FTP. Files can also be copied over the Mac and Linux with native tools like SCP, RSync, and SFTP, so forth and so on. So what we noticed is when we ran the, the adversary emulation tool uh, from uh, uh, VMware Carbon Black that was the, made by Greg Boss, AP, the Invoke APT29. When we ran that, we also had a lot of um, MITRE attack technique rules already in play uh, in our test environment, and we noticed that remote file copy was being triggered on it. And when we looked at it a little bit closer, yep, it looks like that definitely that technique is valid for this particular um, adversary emulation tool of Invoke APT29. So definitely we wanted to cover it, and also as we saw earlier in the slide deck, uh, that definitely when a file gets downloaded from a remote site, yeah, that's part of the remote file copy technique. And let me try and advance the slide here. Uh, there we go. And so when we look at the procedure examples, again, what we see on here, or missing anyway from this list of adversarial groups is APT29. And again, that's just not a notable aspect of the technique um, worth mentioning, I guess, as far as like remote file copy, but it's just something that we did observe. So as an adversary uses specific techniques, they, not, they may not be fully listed in all the techniques in which that they use. Um, that's just what we wanted to point out here. Um, but definitely remote file copy is valid as far as, um, uh, as the APT group 29. Yeah, just I'll jump in really quick. Um, when I'm talking about indicators of removal on a host, um, I I can't remember which one it is. I think it's either, I think it's Estelite. It's not listed on the MITRE ATT&CK framework, um, but it definitely was used by APT29. Uh, thanks for that, Sally. Yeah, it's definitely just something that you want to be uh, you want to be aware of. That it's not a full encompassing list. It's the it's the primary aspects of the list, I guess, as far as like the adversaries that are being called out. Um, you know, as far as like how they're being used. APT29 is using this set of techniques, but it's not all encompassing. That's all we wanted to point out there. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the attack simulation that we used. We used Invoke APT29. Uh, this is from VMware Carmen Black, and our great uh, friend Greg Foss developed this, and uh, within conjunction with uh, Atomic Red teams, uh, the Red Canary folks, uh, on their work as far as like being able to do adversary emulation, uh, a lot of it for um, being able to run in your own environment, so you can run it safely using uh, tools living off the land like PowerShell and everything else like that. Um, so you can run these types of scenarios in your environment and see if you can actually detect them in your environment safely. Um, and it's a great um, it's a great framework to be able to try and use in your environment if you can. Yeah, shout out to to Greg Foss um, who used to work with us. He's a really great engineer. And if you're on Greg, I hope that we can play poker again after all this uh, COVID craziness is over. Excellent. Um, this is a screenshot of the APT uh, twenty the invoke APT twenty nine. Um, GitHub site. So it's a list of all the different techniques that are covered in this Invoke APT29. can be run individually or chained together. Um, again, it's a really great job to be able to, um, again, reproduce what APT29 technique-wise would look like in your environment so you can do detection modeling. 
And again, talking about the spear phishing attachment, I'm not going to get that much into it. Uh, we did an earlier webinar on it, and this is uh, the webinar uh, that we talked a lot about spear phishing attachment on. Um, and again, it's really uh, it goes really in depth on that uh, webinar, so again, I won't talk about it here as much. Um, and same thing with spear phishing link uh, that was under exploring private techniques from MITRE Attack Cloud uh, matrix specific to Office 365. So again, it's one of those things where again we do have content for at Logarithm, um, and it's something that's easily detectable uh, within Office 365 environment. Awesome. So now we're going to do some mini threat hunts here. And for these, we're using the Logarithm Sim web console. But you can use these indicators and techniques with other products. We aren't going to dive into any of the Cozy Bear C2 here. But I just want to mention that I love using Wireshark when I work with C2. It's a really great tool. You can generate the C2 traffic yourself um, with things like the Atomic Red Team framework, capture it with Wireshark to find indicators for threat hunts. There are also a lot of people who share packet captures um, from malware online that you can pull into Wireshark, but always remember, be really cautious about what you download and replay through that. So here we're going to be talking over recordings of our threat hunts for time's sake and because with live demos there's always a chance that something is going to go sideways. These videos um, along with the saved searches and dashboards are going to be available online soon. I should be able to get mine up um, this afternoon. So now that we know a little bit about how APT29 works and we have a few indicators, we can start looking for them in our own environment. So let me start the video here. I'm going to pause it and we'll see how well this will work. So I'm running the a save search from the Logarithm web console, which is what you're seeing here. I have three saved that I'm going to go through today. All right, so here I'll pause it one more time and take a look. So here I'm looking for strings from some of the keys that are going to be manipulated for bypassing user account control. We have MSC files, shell, and ms-settings. At the bottom there, I'm looking specifically for vendor message IDs 13 and 12, which are going to contain those strings. And vendor message ID 13 and 12 comes from Sysmon endpoint logging. So to get these, you do have to have a Sysmon policy configured um, to be monitoring the registry and these specific keys. Um, you can download from the Logarithm GitHub or uh, Swift on Security also has a really good Sysmon policy that you can download. Here as well, um, the mouse is going to go up there, and I'm pointing out that I have a log source filter here. You don't always need that, but because I'm doing a pattern match, I want to specify log sources just to make the search run a little bit quicker here. So now I have the search run, and I'm taking a look at the results. Up in the top right-hand corner, I'm showing that I'm using a saved dashboard that I pre-built called APT29 space SV. If you're running a saved search within the web console, you can assign a specific search dashboard to it. So I have a really simple one here with a couple of widgets. Each one of these graphs is a widget. And what I have here for APT29, looking at PowerShell, Sysmon, and security logs, is definitely a lot different than my dashboards that I use for searches against the firewall or other network devices. So here, under um, Command, I have these commands run in reg, um, run in the command line up at the top there with a placeholder for the actual executable binary. And anything that says creating script block is going to come from PowerShell. You do have to be auditing um, 
script block for PowerShell to get these logs. Again, if you look at the logarithm community, we have some instructions there on how to do that. So here we have two user origins we can see, and I just did a drill out because there's going to be a lot of noise from system, so I did an alt double click to remove any results that came from system. So here I'm going to change one of my widgets to something a little bit more interesting, which is process name, so we can see that reg.exe was what ran a couple of these commands. Also for this particular dashboard, I would normally go with host impacted as one of my widgets. I just don't have it for this particular video because I, it's my own personal malware lab, so I just don't want to show the host names, but what I'm going to release um, will have host impacted in that dashboard. All right, so that is it for that one, so let's move on to the next video. And I think this is the right one here. Yep, this is indicator of removal on a host. So I have two separate searches for this one saved into my favorites. So here, let me pause it again really quick. Oh, no, this is the same one. So let me go next. There we go. Now we've got the correct video. All right, so now we're going to get into my indicator of removal searches. So here we're looking at my search, and I'm going to be specifically looking for commands um, run through the command line or PowerShell. Again, I'm grabbing strings that are going to be seen in those particular commands, so I'm looking at sdelete, wevtutil, and fsutil, which is going to clear the change journal. So here I have my log sources specified rather than specific log sources, but you could do either one. I definitely re recommend um, choosing one or the other if you're going to run a search with a pattern match. So here again, I have my dashboard up here saved. It's a little bit different this time. And something that I'll pause and mention here is that um, it, definitely you can look for these indicators in other products. One that I've used um, to look for S-Delete quite a lot is um, Carbon Black. And I looked for Carbon Black, I looked for the names, I looked for the hashes on Carbon Black. So definitely you can apply this to other tools if you'd like. All right, so here we see the commands being run. So we've got sdelete, fsutil, and again, anything that starts with creating script block text, that is going to come from PowerShell logging. When I was searching for all of this, um, I was quite surprised to find that sdelete is not as commonly used as I thought. Um, I've looked in our own environments, multiple um, customer environments, and again, quite surprised to find that it was pretty rare to be run. All right, so again, you can drill in or out of various items here. So if in a live environment, you would likely have more than one user so you could drill into that user and see just the commands that they've run. I have object here um, as one of my widgets, which again, in the content that I'm going to put out, is going to be host impacted. My second search is log cleared. So I'm running this with uh, metadata that Logarithm assigns to a log cleared log for the Windows events. You could also use the vendor message ID for this type of search. This is something that I actually alarm on as well. Um, it doesn't happen all that often. There are some false positives. Exchange on-prem is something that definitely clears its own logs quite frequently. So that's something you would have to exclude if you were alarming on this. Um, and it's something you would see in the searches, so you could drill in or out. 
So here I see the system log cleared and it was done by administrator. As we can see in the bottom left hand, um, user origin is admin and our object is system, which is the log that was cleared. All right, so those are my two videos. So let's move on to you, Brian. Awesome, thank you. Great presentation. All right, so now I'm gonna cover uh, the remote file copy. And let me get it started here. All right, so this is the web UI console, and of course, doing a search here. And the nice thing about search is if you do a previous search, um, all this is going to be cached. So that's what I want to show you here is that the search that I did previously, I'm just going to be able to invoke that by clicking on the little pin, bring it up. And what I'm looking for is any process service started, as well as uh, containing a process name of command or PowerShell. So the results here, this is a custom dashboard I like to use for in our lab and for development purposes. Uh, it helps display everything pretty nicely, I think, for uh, the purpose of developing content. But what I'm going to switch to here is the threat hunting uh, dashboard. This one's for processes. So this specifically calls out, to, you know, it makes it real easy to see any kind of process start. The previous one just kind of showed it all in the layout, um, but this one shows it nicely just for process start. We see here PowerShell.exe, there's 591 logs represented there. Uh, we're able to double click on it and be able to filter in on it. Now we can see exactly here, oh, look at this. We have some encoded strings here. This definitely looks suspicious. So we can double click on that, filter into exactly that encoded string. And now we have our logs there. Now when we click on our logs, we can see, of course, the parsed out uh, metadata there. Also, we can see here in the analyzer grid, all the information, including the host name in which this impacted, as well as, of course, there's the command line with encoded PowerShell. And also we're able to pivot off of the PowerShell.exe by clicking on the widget and also by going back a minute and going forward five minutes. That's normally what I do whenever I do a pivot is I go back one minute, forward one minute, um, forward five minutes um, for my investigations. Then I'm going to add that to my search here and I'm going to filter it a little bit more and I'm looking for only the logs that we're pulling off of our impacted system. So I'm going to add all those logs that we're collecting and do my search around PowerShell. Here's the result from our, uh, uh, from our search. I'm going to switch dash, uh, dashboards here just to see if there's any kind of networking activity here. So I have a, a dashboard for network traffic, and we do see network traffic very visible here. Uh, we see that it's HTTPS traffic. We see the IP address. We also see, of course, also the city in which it came from. Uh, again, clicking on the actual log there in the analyzer grid, we get all the metadata. We get the information about the host impacted IP address. Of course, we see that it's San Francisco as far as like the location. Um, we get a lot more information over here, such as like it was actually the uh, Windows filtering platform that um, observed this. Now again, filtering on the specific host, we're going to change this to origin uh, or impacted for the host name. And again, searching by one minute in the past and five minutes in the, in the future here, we're going to add it to our search criteria. And we're going to add an additional filtering here. So we're going to look for classification of startup and shutdown. And this is special, and startup and shutdown classification is something that logarithm gives to specific log types. So here we get the results. And we see over here that we get uh, PowerShell and Process Monitor observed it. We see some process started, stopped, and startups. We're going to filter in on the process service startup. Just kind of scrolling through the custom dashboard here. Just again, this is easy for us to be able to use to be able to develop rules and whatnot, see what actually um, processes are in play, and any kind of specific metadata that we can pull out very pretty quickly. But by pulling up in the analyzer clip, analyzer grid here and clicking on one of the log messages, now we can see a lot more in detail here. We see exactly the host name impacted. We see the object uh, being parsed out there, which includes the encoded PowerShell command. So now we're going to take that information. We're going to pivot one minute uh, in the past, five minutes in, four, in the future. And we're looking for specifically, in this case, uh, PowerShell logs. So again, like before, I'm going to focus in specifically on the system of interest that we have. And this time I'm going to add in another filter here and just looking for PowerShell logs. We're collecting the PowerShell. There's two different PowerShell logs, uh, audit logs on Windows systems. 
and we're going to pull both of those back in here, one minute in the past, five minutes in the future. And now here's all of the PowerShell logs that uh, were around that time. And we see some process that were started. We also see some CLI command executed. That's more interesting to us at this period of time. So I'm going to filter in on the CLI command executed. And we're going to pull up in the analyzer grid. I'm going to sort it by um, by the oldest. And again, clicking on the actual log message here, we can see a lot of great information that's being parsed out here. Uh, we see, of course, it's PowerShell. We see over here the object name is apt29.ps1 under the invoke apt29 uh, uh, directory. And of course, we see the subject, right host, decoding and running Empire's version of Mimikatz. And then, of course, we see over here uh, that uh, encoded Mimikatz, local download, and execute. So definitely we see all the aspects and um, uh, all the decoded aspects of the encoded uh, PowerShell command there to be able to download PowerShell uh, and being able to, or downloading uh, Mimikatz to be able to execute on the endpoint. And we see over there that it's going to run the dump creds command. Now within our AI engine environment, I created a rule that's a three rule block, one of which is looking for that process uh, startup. And of course, we're also looking for classification as access success, followed by, of course, outbound connection observed. So with all these three rule blocks in play and when logs coming in, uh, trigger it, that will trigger the remote uh, copy file rule. So just to kind of demonstrate that, we're going to search uh, for common event of the remote file copy. And we're going to change it from logs to events. And we're going to look back for the past 14 days here. Of course, you can go back even further, uh, but for the purpose of this, 14 days uh, searching is fine. So now we're going to search for it, and we see our results. So over here, we see it's been uh, triggered several times. We see, of course, it's PowerShell is the process name, and PowerShell is the parent process name. And when we pull up in the analyzer grid and click on one of the, um, uh, the logs there, again, we see the exact same information as we had before. And we see also now outbound connection observed. So we see the whole play right here in the screen. Process started and outbound connection observed. And of course, we see the encoded PowerShell, which also includes the maybe cast download. And the access success one is our uh, second rule block. And of course, then there's our outbound connection observed. And that by connection observed, we get the IP address, of course, and all the other information relevant uh, to the detection. So this is a way easier way of identifying remote file copy than doing an actual threat hunt. Um, but again, it's one of those things where we had to do uh, the observations first in order to build the rule. And then once we had the rule built, it's, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty easy to use to identify a remote file copy. Awesome. Yeah, that's really good. And um, looking for threats like this is just super interesting. It's I think it's hard to convey how, how interesting it actually is to go actively searching for this in your own environment. And a lot of times, even when I'm not expecting to, just doing the threat hunt is going to, like Brian said, allow me to come up with content that is something that I would want to alarm on if it ever occurred. Awesome. That's it. That was super interesting, and uh, we've got some pretty good questions. You guys ready for some Q&A? Yeah. Um, so let's see here. Wahab says, assuming that the end user doesn't have the admin right, uh, none of that um, H key registry hive could be modified. Is that correct? And that goes back a while. Do you, uh, that, are you placing that the question? Is yeah, that is correct. Um, and making sure that your users don't have local admin um, and you don't give that away to many people is a way that you can um, stop that from occurring. 
And it, it really depends upon the registry key because mm -hmm. there's no registry key that, where the entire hive is uh, limited to admin authority. So I, I think um, Wahab, you really have to get down to the registry key level before you can make a statement about what the default permissions are in Windows registry. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, Dominic has a question about logarithm. Do these APT searches come pre-configured in logarithm? Uh, they don't, um, but we plan to release these on the logarithm community site, I believe. Um, I should have mine up later in the day. Let's see here. Mikhail asks, do all of uh, the procedures and searches described work in a hybrid environment? So, um, Mikhail, a lot of this is specific to the Windows operating system, and so I, I don't think that's, uh, um, I, I think the, the short answer to that is no, but maybe, maybe I'm misreading his question. What do you guys think? I think you're correct. I think these are generally um, for Windows only. Uh, there are some that might go over into um, a Linux environment, like log cleared um, or indicators of removal on a host. But yeah, this is really Windows specific here today. So Brad's got a good one. Uh, he says, you may have already said this, but to get much of this information from a Windows system, are Sysmon logs pretty much required? Um, the standard app system and security logs don't provide everything we need. So um, it's inter that's an interesting question, right? Um, there's um, a lot of the information I think you were talking about you could get from the security log, but occasionally um, there are specific uh, extra fields of information that are only available with Sysmon. But um, where do you guys come down on that for the stuff we were talking about today? Security log or Sysmon or both? Well, right. So like for the remote file copy aspect of things, uh, that can actually be supported with fully Microsoft built-in audit policies. Uh, when we look at uh, the 4688 events uh, per process or restart, the key thing there is that you want to be able to configure command line auditing uh, for the process start. That is not on by default, and you definitely want to assess you know, your own risk as to enabling command line auditing. But then mm -hmm. that will give you a lot of visibility into exactly, um, of course, the command being used. In this case, it would probably show the encoded PowerShell uh, string uh, being triggered. Uh, the other thing, too, is on the remote uh, file copy is that we focus heavily in on PowerShell audit logs. Again, that's built mm -hmm. into Microsoft audit policies. Uh, so again, you don't need Microsoft Sysmon for those uh, detections. Um, but Microsoft Sysmon definitely provides a lot more um, greater visibility as to what the process does. And also it provides a nice uh, user GUID uh, tracking mechanism uh, that we parse out uh, to be able to then pivot off of that uh, GUID to be able to then pull in all the activity that Microsoft Sysmon observed, painting the picture of exactly what happened a lot easier. Yeah, and Maurice kind of gets into that, that the other big one, uh, besides the security log and Sysmon, like you said, are the PowerShell um, audits. And Maurice uh, says, are we also seeing and picking up memory-only PowerShell scripts and commands? And yeah, when you're using PowerShell auditing, you're getting, um, you, you can potentially get a full transcript of everything running through PowerShell, every command block, every script block, everything. Um, it really depends on how how you configure it. What is the relationship between APT and Sandworm? I'm th I'm thinking Jim means APT29 and Sandworm. What do you think? APT29 has used so many um, different techniques and. Yeah, when we look at MITRE ATT&CK's group listing here, of course, it's another great way to be able to use MITRE ATT&CK um, and to be able to see exactly 
how the groups interrelate and everything else like that. So Sandworm team is one of the groups that are also listed on MITRE ATT&CK uh, enterprise um, uh, list here. And when we look at it, uh, of course, Sandworm team is a Russian cyber espionage group that has operated since approximately 2009. The group likely consists of Russian proactivists. Sandworm team targets mainly Ukrainian entities associated with energy, industrial control systems, SCADA, government, and media. Um, so when we look at the compare and contrast of it, of course, over here, according to what it looks like with MITRE anyway, pointing it out, is that they're, um, a, they're a different group. They're not the federal group of uh, within the Russian government. It uh, looks like that this is uh, consists of Russian uh, pro-hacktivist group. Uh, so it's a different group. They could be using similar software tools. Uh, in this case, the software tool that primarily they used uh, called out a MITRE attack uh, site here is Black Energy. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there looks like there's maybe a couple other names around them, including Voodoo Bear. Um, so again, it's a great way to be able to pivot off of uh, the different groups, see how they interrelate. But again, really focusing on the techniques and the software that they use is really the key point uh, to be able to understand what you need to protect in your environment. Yeah. Going back to Sysmon for a second, Doug says the registry and file create and delete stuff in Sysmon is awesome, and I have to agree with you on that, Doug. There are just a few areas of activity, system activity, where Sysmon gives you a lot more information than what the security log does. Another one of those areas is with regard to um, uh, seeing the hashes of EXEs and DLLs that are loaded. Windows just doesn't give you that. Um, but that is such a nice way to detect every time, you know, new bits are executed in your environment. And then there are other events that Windows auditing just does not catch um, that Sysmon uh, does. And it's, Microsoft is kind of using Sysmon as a way to um, patch and augment holes that become evident in the Windows auditing. Uh, system without going in there and actually messing around with the bits of, of that deep, deep part of Windows, which I think they haven't touched in a long time. Um, so Sysmon does get updated. Let's see here. Samir says, some of the times the most scary ones are teleworkers connect to the office network every few days, so the queued logs just jump in at once. Um, Richard so I agree with you, that's always a challenge. Uh, unless you can forward logs over the internet safely. But anyway, next question. Richard says, being a logarithm user, is there any smart responses we could also implement with this to help automate our protection against this type of attack? There's a couple I can think of. Um, we have a few smart responses that I've used to do things like isolate a host. Um, disable a user, um, stop a process. So those are all um, ones that might apply here. Um, we also have several that work with various types of, of firewalls, so ASA, um, Palos, to add an IP um, to a blacklist. So there's a few that would work with this. Um, and Charles says, so if you have no Sysmon installed or working with your logarithm setup, will you be able to find any of the things that were shown in this video? Um, I can just jump in and say, yeah, a lot of it, like we said, is still available in the, the Windows security log. But is there anything else you guys want to add to that? Um, I will say that the, what I showed is about half um, just additional Windows auditing without Sysmon and half Sysmon. Um, so the PowerShell auditing that I showed um, is something that you can just enable um, on your endpoints with group policy. Um, Stuart says, I have had a look at the logarithm recommended Sysmon config on GitHub, and as I recall, it includes two different types of hashes. In a previous webinar, it was suggested that logarithm could only handle one type of hash. Is this no longer the case? Do you know what he's referring to, or is that something you want to uh, take take up offline? No, it basically, I mean, so the configuration for the uh, Sysmon uh, that we're providing, uh, it does allow you to um, 
have multiple hashes. We will only pull in the one hash though, the MD5 hash into logarithm. Uh, it's a multi-value field and we can only support one of the hash uh, lengths. So we do the MD5 one because it's most compatible with uh, other uh, security solutions out there that mostly only produce an MD5 hash uh, for that output. But of course that can be changed in the NPE rule itself to exactly which one it will parse into that field. Uh, but the reason why that we put all the hashes uh, in the in the raw log anyway is so if you do search against the raw logs uh, for a particular hash value that's like uh, SHA-256 or, or SHA-1, whatever, you're able to now find that within the log message even though it's not being parsed out. And um, it just makes it easier for an analyst to be able to see if they've ever seen it before or not without having to do a, a value translation. Awesome. Um, well, this has been super interesting. Um, it's evident why cybersecurity is so dynamic and challenging when you're up against groups like this nowadays, wouldn't you agree? Um, you can see the resources that they've got behind them. Oh, definitely. I mean, when you, when you have a nation state targeting you, um, I mean, it's like James Bond, right? If James Bond is coming, uh, you know, coming at after you coming into your company, you're not going to be able to stop James Bond. A nation state is the same way. They're well-funded. They're very stealthy. Um, but definitely uh, the whole point of all of this is being able to emulate an adversary to be able to see exactly how they would work in your environment, what techniques would they do, and can you see those techniques being used generally speaking. Um, there are times when like APT29, I think it was in the F-Secure report, uh, that was calling out specifically that, you know, sometimes they would be incredibly noisy. They would do smash and grabs. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you aren't logging endpoints, you may never see the adversary uh, on your network, no matter how noisy they are. That is a great uh, comment to go off, uh, to, to go out on. And that is, if you're not logging your endpoints, um, so much of the attacks today happen on the endpoint and and they begin on the endpoint so if we want to catch these things early in the uh, attack life cycle before a lot of damage has been done um, and as you indicated sometimes if we want to see anything at all we we have to know what's happening out on those user endpoints well um, let's see here I think that covers it for today. We really appreciate everybody's time. And um, Sally and Brian, uh, thanks for showing us uh, what you've been able to put together with regard to Cozy Bear. And uh, as well, um, really cool technology that you've got there with Logarithm. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Have a good day, everybody. We'll be in touch again soon. Bye-bye for now.